I'd like to uh, commence this evening's event with an acknowledgement of country. The University of Melbourne acknowledges the traditional owners of the unceded land on which we work, learn and live. The Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong peoples, the Yorta Yorta Nation and the Dja Dja Wurrung people. The University also acknowledges and is grateful to the traditional owners, elders and knowledge holders of all Indigenous nations and clans who have been instrumental in our reconciliation journey. We recognise the unique place held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent with histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. We also acknowledge their enduring cultural practices of caring for country. We pay respect to elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the academy. As a community of researchers, teachers, professional staff and students, we are privileged to work and learn every day with Indigenous colleagues and partners. The Narama Oration is the university's key address profiling leading Indigenous peoples from across the world. The oration is intended to enrich our ideas with respect to possible futures for Indigenous Australia. Nam refers to the country of the Melbourne region and if you look at the earliest colonial maps, uh, no one was calling the bay Port Phillip Bay, it was called Nam. This is the land of the Kulin Confederation of Nations. This is the 14th oration held in what is a very important year for the people of Victoria, especially Indigenous people of Victoria. Launched in March this year, the Uruk Justice Commission will spearhead the first formal truth-telling process into past and ongoing injustices experienced by First Peoples in Victoria as a result of colonisation. Uruk delivered an interim report in June this year and will deliver its final report by June 2024. The University of Melbourne is currently engaged in its own process of truth-telling with the Indigenous History of the University of Melbourne project. This significant piece of work is an outcome of a 2019 research colloquium on place and Indigenous cultural recognition, which identified the need to formally acknowledge our institutional and colonial past and our complicity with respect to eugenics and scientific racism. The university commissioned this Indigenous-led research project to formally and transparently articulate that contested history of the university. To date, more than 70 people, they're all staff of the university, have agreed to contribute to this project. One of the very first outputs is a book that will address the findings of this research project. The book will be published by Melbourne University Press later next year. So welcome uh, to this year's oration and I will now pass over to John Wayne Parsons. It now gives me a great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker to deliver the 2022 Naram Oration. Truth, understanding, transformation, laying the foundation for change. Professor Eleanor Burke AM is a Wegaya Wemba Wemba Elder and is the chair of the Yuruk Justice Commission. Professor Burke has held ex executive positions in Commonwealth, state and federal government agencies. She was the co-chair of Reconciliation Victoria for three years board member for the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Council for 12 years, and a board member of Native Title Services Victoria. In 2005, Professor Burke Wurgaya family was recognised in Victoria's first 
positive native title determination, now known as the Wajabalak case. This native title included five first peoples, Wajabalak, Wagaya, Jarawa, Jarawajali and Jupuguk peoples. Professor Burke has had an extensive career in academia. She was a professor of Aboriginal and Islander studies and director of Aboriginal programs at Monash University. She was also previously an associate professor and director of the Aboriginal Research Institute at the University of South Australia. She was inducted into the Victorian Honour Roll for Women in 2010 and in Victoria Aboriginal Honour Roll in 2019. Professor Burke chaired the working group to the former Victorian Treaty of Advancement Commission, led by Commissioner Jill Gallagher AO, in supporting the establishment of the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. She presided over the election of the board of the First Peoples Assembly in December 11, 2019. In 2022, Professor Burke was awarded member of the Order of Australia. And just a few little highlights. Professor Eleanor Burke's connection to the University of Melbourne stems back to 1977 and in and, and 1980, where Professor Burke was the university's Aboriginal liaison officer, in which she worked tirelessly to recruit into and support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and staff at the university. So the title of Professor Burke's oration, Truth, Understanding, Transformation, Laying the Foundation for Change. Without further ado, please welcome to the stage, Professor Eleanor Burke, AM. <laughs> I thank the University of Melbourne for inviting me to speak this evening. I think it's evening now. <laughs> and thank you all for coming to hear this speech. These lands here in Parkville are very different to how they were back in 1853 when the University of Melbourne was first established. There were no sky skyscrapers or football stadiums, stadiums and, those, and those with money travelled in horse and cart. The technology we have today, that you have today, was not even a dream. I believe the university started as a cluster of buildings in a park on this northern fringe of the city with just four professors and 16 students. And look at it, look at it now, <laughs> look at the mass. And even since I've been here, <clears throat> since I've been back in Victoria in 20 years, it has changed so much. The 1850s were a time of rapid growth in Victoria following the discovery of gold. And Melbourne's population quickly attracted people from other parts of the world. It was the first wave of multiculturalism multicultural populations coming. The first, and the first displays of blatant racism against the Chinese people who came to the gold. During this time, many of Victoria's first peoples were displaced or killed and their land stolen. In 1860, the Sale of Crown Lands Act was passed and this enabled laws to enable settlers to obtain land. For First Peoples, this meant being forced off traditional lands, the land being divided off and sold off to white people under this colonial law. I want to refer a little to the story of Corrandirk Aboriginal Reserve today because it was a first formal inquiry into Aboriginal affairs, if you like, in this state of Victoria as we now are. Corrandirk was established in 1863 and was the first of a number of Aboriginal reserves across Victoria. Many have disappeared from 
people's memory, but there were six that I think have survived and still have land attributed to uh, some of our, where, where some of our traditional owners now live. John Green, a Scottish Presbyterian preacher, oversaw the reserve. He believed Aboriginal people had the right to decide uh, for themselves. He believed in their entitlement to be on their land. And they did farm and raise livestock and carry out their cultural practices. The residents formed an assembly which decided on the rules of conduct on the station as well as the punishments for breaking those rules. They developed a, enough food, shelter and clothing and had a level of trust with Green. In 1872, hops farming was introduced and the people, our people, the Wurundjeri people, were successful. But this success was to be a downfall. Green had been removed and the people were unhappy and they wished him to be reinstated. But the Board of Protection had other ideas. They wanted to close Corrandirk, move the residents up near the Murray River and to sell the land. But there was resistance, led by William Barrack, who was the leader of Corrandirk at that time. Under Barrack, residents wrote letters and signed petitions and used their connections to appeal to more progressive politicians, as they understood, and to some, some of the media. Their advocacy forced the government's hand and an inquiry was held, a formal inquiry at Corrandirk was held and it was into the conditions and management of Corrandirk. In total, 22 Aboriginal witnesses gave evidence during the two and a half month inquiry, putting their wishes forward about the future of the reserve. Their testimony created a public record for us to read some 140 years later. The inquiry enabled Corrandirk to stay open and conditions improved for a time. However, in 1886, the Aboriginal Protection Act, which was known by many as the Half-Caste Act, came in, enabling the separation of families of First Peoples who had some European blood from others. People considered half-castes were removed from the reserves, forced to be away, miles away, the other side of the state, away from their, uh, their families. And this was the beginning of the removal of children, not the protection of them, but the removal of very young people from their families. Gradually, the population of Corrandirk declined and portions of the land were carved up and offered for sale for settlers. The story of Corrandirk is important in two ways. I personally and other, I hope other Aboriginal people are inspired by the strength and resilience of the people on Corrandirk to do what they did. And to present their petition, petitions, they walked to Melbourne from where they lived, out Hillsville Way. Not once or twice, but numerous times. Secondly, their, their um, activities reinforce, reinforce the need for truth-telling to be part of a bigger process to create transformative change for First Peoples. Truth on its own is not enough. And I'd like to go to a little bit about myself, and I hope I'm not going to be repetitive. I'll have a, something, a Barry, your, your um, introduction. Um, it, sorry, uh, John, your introduction was so fulsome. Uh, and I thank you for that. So 1943, the year I was born, in the Hamilton, in the Hamilton Base Hospital, 
It was a year before the last resident at Corran Dirk died. It was also in the middle of the war. And this is a war which we think some 3,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people fought, even though they had few, if any, rights under Australian laws. My father was of Scottish and Irish heritage, landing, landing in the west of the state, and my mum of Wudagaya, Wamba Wamba descent through her parents. They met, I can't say online, they met through a, um, <laughs> a, a page in the Weekly Times. Now, I don't know if there are enough country people to know about the longevity of the Weekly Times, but it used to have a page, a pen pals page called the Miranda, Miranda and she was kind of the editor of the letters they got. And they became pen pals and they wrote to each other for three years. I still don't know to this day whether they actually met before they decided to marry or not. But um, they married and after, I think, about three years, my, they moved to where my mother's family came from, near Lake Boga and the Murray River. And I suspect that my mother, by then, expecting her third child, wanted to be back with her family. But I was never told that. I'm surmising that because of where we went. We went to a little place called Murraydale, which is in the west side of uh, Swan Hill, a dairy farming, very s small dairy farming area. Uh, now, of course, the land is so degraded and uh, it, it, it's not being farmed in that way at all. But I went to school at Murraydale Primary School, which is a small school. It was barely like a hut now, I suppose. Four rows of seats, a row per grade, the school, 40 students, and I was the only Aboriginal child in that classroom. I won't talk about that experience, but uh, people noticed that I was brown. Everybody else was white. So I come from a big family on my mother's side and the proximity to my grandmother was, for me, uh, inspirational. She was strong and proud to be Aboriginal. She was born on a mission, Ebenezer Mission in the northwest, under Moravian um, control. She was well educated and she was able to be with her Total, uh, whole family, her parents and her siblings, into her teens. And I think for her that was a kind of a safety thing for her because she was not, um, she was not bitter as some people are about their experiences on reserves. She was strong and she, her experience made her ensure that her children went to school and I've seen some photos of my aunts, uncles and mother, and they do not look happy because, like me, they were the dark kids in the photograph. And they did, my mother especially, she hated photographs all her life, and I think it stems from those school photos. But coming from a big family with my grandmother in the background, she told stories of our ancestors our connection to place, who we were through the totems that we held, names from people never, that we would ne never meet but were treated like um, heroes, really, in, 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 you know, in myths and that sort of thing. So we grew up with that strength of belief in coming from a strong family with a very strong background. We had large gatherings sometimes at Christmas and Easter, at that time, we all lived closely. Uh, we don't, I don't think families live as closely now as we used to before uh, motor cars and things like that. Uh, and this, for me, gave me strength because of being surrounded by such a, <coughs> a large family. For reasons of health, my siblings, uh, the health of my siblings we had to move to Muldura for specialist medical care. So most of mum's sisters moved too, so we 
all ended up in Muldura, further away from uh, where we was our country. It was particularly important because both my parents' health deteriorated at similar times. My mother got Murray Valley encephalitis and our lives changed. So in Muldura, I went to uh, Muldura High School and left in year nine. But my first job was in a pharmacy in the main street of Muldura. It was a large pharmacy with a significant um, stock room. And to this day, the training I had in that place is the best training I've ever had. It was graduated uh, training in the before you could work in the shop, you had to work in the stock room and then you went to front of house. And if you had something to offer, you went to a smaller pharmacy that was in, a, um, in the precinct, the hospital precinct, where a number of doctors' surgeries were and uh, worked with a pharmac pharmacist there, which mainly involved delivering, picking up prescriptions and delivering them picking up from the doctors and delivering them to the patients who also lived in this close proximity. Totally different kind of world, but uh, uh, fascinating to look back on it because uh, it's memorable and probably will never, never happen again. After leaving school, I married a Greek man soon after who'd come to work in Muldura. We had two daughters, moved to Melbourne, and lived within the Greek community for some 20 years. I speak Greek fluently still. I worked at the Kodak factory in Coburg for some 10 years with people from across Europe who had emigrated after that war, 40s. I remember voting in the 1967 referendum and being angry at the fact we had been excluded for so long from the constitution of this country. After working at Kodak, I did a brief stint at the Aborigines Advancement League, where I was introduced to Aboriginal Affairs Movement and the League's meetings and its hostel at Northcote. Later, I worked with the Commonwealth Department of Aboriginal Affairs in 1970, which is where I met Graham Atkinson. I was in the typing pool, and Graham was bringing some typing in to be handed to a supervisor, who then distributed the work to the typist. Another world. I was also um, Aboriginal... Um, Aboriginal Liaison Officer at this university for approximately three years. When I landed here, there was nobody to greet me, there was no office, and uh, somebody got in touch with, I think it was the registrar at the time, Frank O'Neill, to say that the Aboriginal Liaison Officer had turned up and what to do about it. So <laughs> I ended up in, in a small house in... Um, Swanson Street, and I couldn't see today on my drive out to see if it's still there or not, or whether it's been demolished. After that, I went to work for... I, I moved out of... Um, uh, in Aboriginal Affairs, I got out of the typing pool and I got into the, in, into, uh, the um, uh, clerical work and started to uh, look to moving myself um, into more important work, I thought. But I left... Uh, the department to go and um, after the, I left the uh, university to go and work for the state government. In Victoria at that time the ministers for Aboriginal Affairs were ministers for Aboriginal Affairs and Housing and I worked for uh, ministers Brian Dixon and Jeff Kennett very briefly and that was interesting. They were interesting experiences as well. In the 1980s, my life changed dramatically. I remarried and moved to Canberra. I went to work for the Commonwealth Government as Director of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Security Services in the Department of Social Security. 
I was responsible for de developing the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Services Program. This program was based within Social Security State offices and had networks um, that were built on the introduction of Aboriginal liaison officers. Whilst I was uh, uh, working, I obtained an undergraduate degree in professional writing at the former Canberra CAE. In addition, I was involved with the establishment of the ACT Aboriginal Education Consultant Group, filling a gap in the ACT. Uh, we had, um, at that time, a National Aboriginal um, Education Committee being established, and each of the states had their own uh, Aboriginal consultative groups, and the Victorian Aboriginal Education Consultative Group, which is now VAI, had already been formed before um, I went to Canberra. So it completed the, the network. I was also involved with the establishment of the ACT Kuris Club, which was a social club in which we managed the, the, the NAIDOC activities most years, and some of our friends from, in, uh, from down here in Melbourne would come up for the occasional ball, including one Faye Carter, <laughs> June Atkinson, and uh, Merle Jackamos. <laughs> it's a roll call. So, after a decade in, almost a decade in Canberra, we moved to Adelaide. I obtained work at the then South Australian College of Advanced Education as head of the Aboriginal Research Centre. That was um, to merge with the South Australian Institute of Technology where Wayne, Graham's brother, did his task force course. The merge created the um, University of South Australia, and that's where I headed the um, Aboriginal Research Centre. But during this time, the Faculty of Aboriginal Islander Studies, as it was then, got involved with um, two projects that I want to mention because they, I think they were uh, game changers in many ways, and you might not know about them now. In the... Um, Early 90s, the university was approached by the ABC to develop the introduction to Aboriginal Studies course for open learning. And so the, um, the plan was to uh, create a curriculum. The ABC would go out and film after a framework was designed and staff would write the scripts or the text that managed, uh, matched the um, open learning. We had staff who wouldn't, and I'm speaking collectively here because uh, my husband was the driver of this, but we had staff who did not want to write because they did not think we would succeed to do the work around the scripts in time to match the uh, filming. But we did, we did. And uh, so the open learning course, the introduction to Aboriginal Studies course, was, became a publication for University of Queensland Press. And they, it's been in press up until not that long ago and had um, uh, other uh, multiple editions. Its time has passed, of course. It was very introductory. It was very different mode. The second um, thing that I was involved in again, as a staff member of that faculty, is the Aboriginal Summer School for Excellence in Technology and Science, Assets, an Assets Program, which I think has continued on in other, other ways um, since. But at that time, uh, it was decided to offer a summer school for students who, to pre help prepare them towards completing high school. It was supported by um, IBM for the computers to be provided at Prince, Albert, uh, Prince Alfred College in um, um, Adelaide. And Qantas would fly 
um, the students or the kids in from any around Australia. And we, as staff, worked to do the lessons. And we had a mathematician, uh, somebody who was a computer whiz, who also had very high skills at that time because he'd spent some time in Silicon Valley. So they were well, uh, they were well able to be to learn a few tricks with computers at that time in this early 90s. And I mention it because it changed the lives of many of those people. I believe it's still going with different sponsors. I'm not sure what's happened since, um, since COVID, but it has changed the lives of many people and so their names pop up from time to time. And one, one such student, who I didn't know but I'd been made aware, uh, had applied to work at the Yurok Justice Commission. And uh, some people may know um, Ky Dr Kylie Cripps, who, whose life was changed from, uh, from that experience. And they're just the two that I know. There are many others that have had, a, had, had that experience. And it was interesting over the decades for us to see how people cherished not just the experience, but the discipline as well of the 10 days that they had to uh, do assignments and make a presentation and give a speech at the end of their, their work on the summer school. Also, at, around this time, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody presented its final report, which led to legislation for a national process of reconciliation over 10 years. Funnily, that was, I think, the first recommendation from that report that was implemented. That report had 339 recommendations to reform the justice system, but more than 500 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have died since then. And many of the recommendations remain the end of the 90s, my family worked to live in, uh, returned to live in Victoria after those two decades, almost two decades, interstate. I worked at Monash for some three years before retirement, at the beginning of this century. But I was encouraged to become involved in some committees. I became co-chair for Reconciliation Victoria alongside Dr Diane Sicily. I became a board member of Native Title Services Victoria and later uh, the, the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Council, which I served on for 12 years and chaired um, four or five times. During this phase, early this century, many discussions around land justice. We had a cohort of people who were looking to make change in the land justice area. We had the Yorta Yorta decision, negative, and to the credit, I think, of our people here in Victoria, despite the hurt, the trauma, there was determination to get recognition. And as you might have heard in the introduction, I, uh, I was a member of the, one of the five clans, my family, um, being part of the Wajabalak, Jadwa, Jadwa Jali, Wadagaya and Jabagal peoples, 2005. We have seen progress at the national level or movement from the commemoration of the first National Sorry Day in 1998, Kevin Rudd's apology on behalf of Australian people in the Parliament in 2008, and the Victorian Government's um, Stolen Generations reparations pa package announced in March this year. These events raised some expectation 
but they have not delivered better outcomes for our people. Today, First Peoples die younger, suffer greater health complications, have poorer access to health and education services, and are more prone to uh, diseases and like COVID. Today, Aboriginal footballers are celebrated for their on-field achievements, provided they don't challenge the racism they face in the course of their being successful footballers. Today, our people are committing suicide at a more than double the rate of non-Indigenous people, one of the hallmarks of intergenerational trauma. I heard a statistic just a week ago that in Victoria in 2021, there was a 75% increase in suicides recorded. I find that staggering. It was just staggering to hear that. I don't know what the real number is, but it's alarming. Today, Aboriginal children in Victoria are 20 times more likely to be removed from their families than non-Indigenous people. There's something wrong with the system. The system is broken. Today, Aboriginal men and women are 14 times more likely to be incarcerated than non-Indigenous Victorians. Now, these issues are within the Euro Justice Commission's terms of reference. The truth, is, the truth is, however, that the colonial system has con concentrated on maintaining power by controlling and legislating the Indigenous population and taking the land for wealth. If there has been progress, it has not been addressed by any systemic by, uh, um, sorry, the systemic inequalities have maintained this status quo. Sorry, I lost my place there. In Victoria, though, as I alluded to, the beginning of this century describing where I have worked, we have seen some foundations for transformational change slowly being built in the land justice area. And I see these as walking in the footsteps of the people who went before us. Despite the order, order, people believed we were entitled to native title rec recognition. So we saw from 2005, as I mentioned, with my mob, the first of four successful native title determinations in Victoria. And this was really important because when native title was discussed in Canberra, there was a belief that it would only apply to 5% of the Aboriginal population, and that population lived in the Northern Territory and in Western Australia. The next thing that happened was the introduction of the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Act, becoming law allowing for registered Aboriginal parties made up of traditional owner groups uh, to have some responsibility legally on their land. The passing of the Traditional Owner, uh, Owner Settlement Act was another step which enabled, or the, the state government introduced, to recognise traditional owners in a state, uh, state system and to um, be able to to enable traditional owners to make agreements with the state government. And uh, Graham, I you know, acknowledge your work in this space because you led uh, from the beginning with the, the very loose land justice group, which, uh, which has stayed around. Many of the people that were in that group of 30 or 40 people are still around making different kinds of contributions. In 2018, as was mentioned, the, the, um, 
the establishment of the Victorian Treaty Advancement Commission, chaired by uh, Commissioner Jill Gallagher, moved the discussions around treaty planning out of the government space into uh, a space managed by an Aboriginal commissioner. And I, I take my hat off to Jill every time I talk about a commission because she was a single person and the, uh, the legacy from and the work that she did was um, the foundation upon which the First Peoples Assembly uh, was um, established. The legislation that the First Peoples Assembly came into being with was all planned in, within the Victorian Treaty Advancement Commission. So the legislation enabled um, them by step to, to fulfil certain things that had to happen before treaty negotiations could, <coughs> could begin. So last month, a landmark framework for treaty negotiations was signed by the Victorian Government and the First Peoples' Assembly. And they envisage that this will see the start of negotiations for statewide and individual treaties from 2023. Yesterday, I attended a briefing from First Peoples' Assembly about how the next phase of treaty making will unfold. And I, I was heartened by what I heard. I'm not sure about the time, the, the expectation that it'll start from next year, but there is a plan and it's um, an inclusive plan and it is at more local levels. It made for me personally a real, for the that the prospect of treaty can happen and not that far away. However, we know that treaties have taken years and years in other places. As we work to make this happen, I, I, the rest of Australia and parts of the world are watching what's happening with Uruk. As you're aware, I think the Uruk Justice Commission is unique in this country the first truth-telling after 230 years. It was established following the tire tireless advocacy of those elders we remember every time we're acknowledging country, those ancestors who made footsteps in the sand before there were bricks on the pavement. And we remember them sincerely because without what they did before and what happened at Corran Dirk, uh, we would not be able to, uh, wouldn't have, maybe not have the strength and the belief. So Uruk Justice Commission is a royal commission with all the powers of a royal commission established by Letters Patent in May of last year. It has all the powers of a Royal Commission and it has the ability to compel witnesses and has already issued notices to produce to government departments. As I said, it's the first and only truth-telling process in Australia, but it's among about 50 in the world. And we, when we were trying to get ourselves briefed, we talked to some of the inter other international people and people that worked in that space to understand what was required. Uruk has a broad historic mandate to investigate the systemic injustices experienced by Victoria's peoples in all, er all areas of life, from invasion and colonisation to the present. It is broad and deep and is a major challenge and it certainly won't be done in three years and there will be decisions that have to be made uh, about 
the priorities, some of which we've embarked on already. Our work will also create a formal public record by putting the testimony, the voices, the stories of our people on the record for generations to come. The word Yuruk means truth in the lang language of my Wamba, Wamba people. It will make recommendations for healing, systemic reform and changes to laws and policies. As commissioners of this historic commission, we're very aware of the responsibility that rests with us. We recognise the significance for other states. And I must say, Jackie, we wish you well with your work. We wish you well with your work and we'll be watching. And uh, again, one of the ones whose footsteps are ahead for the next generation. Yuruk was established at the recommendation of the First People's Assembly of Victoria. When they met and had their discussion, initial discussions about treaty, they recognised that without some truth-telling among our Victorian population, treaty might not happen or even succeed. So this commission is about bringing all Victorians along with us. As I mentioned, it has a broad and detailed terms of reference. It's eight or nine pages long. Uh, it has seven specific objectives, um, but a, a two-page and a bit outline of terms of reference. But we tried, we tried, crazily tried, to distill this down to, to three words. Truth, understanding and transformation. So truth is about the creation of a lasting public record based on First Peoples' experiences of systemic injustice since the beginning and the consequences of these experience, experiences and who or what is responsible. Understanding is about bringing all other Victorians with us on this journey. So an audience like this is very important to me and to commissioners because we want to share the story and we want you to come on the journey and to learn about the true history, the true history, its impact and the strength and resilience of our people of our culture, knowledge and traditions that have survived against all the odds and have much to offer mainstream <coughs> society. And the final word, transformation, is to recommend changes to laws, institutions and systems which can then be taken up through treaty negotiations and help build foundations for a new, new relationship between First Peoples, the state government and all Victorians. We have a way to go. Earlier this year, fellow commissioners and I went out on country, speaking to elders at meetings along the Murray River in the east, southwest, central Victoria <coughs> and here. One elder told of a conversation she heard while travelling where she sat opposite a young woman and her friends who were visiting from overseas. And the young woman asked the traveller travellers questions about their homeland and its history. And on hearing the discussion, the young woman said, you're so lucky, you have so much history I'm from Australia and we have no history. Australia is home to the oldest continuous cultures in the world. It has a history that predates European arrival by tens of thousands of years 
Yet none of that was visible to this young woman. And I have heard this story before of people believing that there is no history. It's a stark illustration of the need for First Peoples-led truth-telling to inform and transform Victoria's shared understanding of the history and culture of this place and its peoples. We've had some data out just this morning, I think it was announced, public, the Australian um, Reconciliation Barometer, which um, was updated from two years ago, that showed around a quarter of Australians surveyed were unsure or disbelieved fundamental aspects of our shared history. This includes the presence of First Peoples in Australia at the time of the European arrival, the occurrence of mass killings, the belief that massacres happened, about the incarceration, the forced removal from land and the restriction of movement. There's something wrong with our education system if these things cannot be taught because they are written down and they were written down by the, the, the people that um, created them and put them on the record. A reassuring thing that came out of this information today is that potentially five out of six Australians believed in the, in, in the importance of a formal truth-telling process. I do want to address the fact that Uruk, as a royal commission, which is a colonial system of investigation, it's an irony that we are inside a, con a colonial construct of the public service, the management of funds, the confines of how we conduct our uh, investigations, still connects back to colonialism. It's a challenge and we're very aware of it. But it, within the terms of reference, we have been given authority to con conduct, conduct a, a different kind of inquiry in that we must accommodate our people from a cultural perspective, that they are comfort comfortable in our space, comfortable speaking to us and comfortable um, giving their voices to the public record. And I have to say, as an individual commissioner, I was heartened and overwhelmed by the generosity of our people. Uh, going out and speaking and hearing the, the worst of the worst stories, the extremities of the stories, people crying, desperate, but at the end of it, saying thank you, thank you for hearing this, and then saying, I feel lighter now. It, it, it's uh, overwhelming. And we're not even to the stage for some getting the, uh, these, to the nitty-gritty of what they want to say to the treaty. So we're working very hard to ensure that every step of the process is culturally safe, respectful, and that there is support for those who engage with Uruk. We do not want to create harm, so there is flexibility, or create more trauma, I should say. But there is a mantra in the air about treaty, treaty without truth. There is no treaty without truth. Uruk is now accepting submissions from all Victorian First Peoples at the moment, all First Peoples who have experienced systemic injustice in Victoria who may come from somewhere else. And the flexibility in our approach is that a submission can take any form the person may wish to use in submitting 
a contribution. And that goes to song, artwork, poetry, painting, a play, music, gym, a play. Um, so uh, I, I think, uh, and some people have already given us things, um, a poem, uh, a message, um, even an artefact as well that belongs somewhere in the West. Being, and charged me with the uh, responsibility of finding where it should belong. So the coming months will see our investigation focus on the impact of child protection and criminal justice systems on the First Peoples. And it will be a challenging time for our people. These issues have been well, well documented. Some of the solutions are even well known. There are many recommendations from reports, making recommenda recommendations in these spaces that have not been enacted. And this is the challenge. Why, when some recommendations are sitting in reports and are known to government, why have they not been enacted? So this process has taken more than 200 years, but there has to be a shared understanding based on the inclusion of our people, their voices, as part of a uh, foundation for truth and justice going into the future, and it has to be part of our education system. I mentioned the Open Learning series earlier in which I wrote a chapter called Images and Reality and Realities. At that time, uh, most of the images were created by non-Aboriginal people, about Aboriginal people in the media. I was making that point that we were at that time hostage to those images created by other, other Australians of who they thought we were. And there's some pretty awful uh, images, uh, but I, you're probably too young to know some of the things that I refer to. I was thinking of a certain cartoonist and other things. But since that time, there's been a plethora of Aboriginal media, Aboriginal media, Aboriginal people's voices, faces, songs on television <coughs> and, and um, on the radio. And uh, particularly with our national broadcaster, the, uh, the daily identification of where journalists are broadcasting from, the names of the places uh, as they go around the country with their national news, has to have some traction if people can just learn one of those words every day or every week and learn about the place. I encourage all Victorians to seek out opportunities to learn about the history of our country and its First Peoples, but because the history is in every place, every Aboriginal name, near where you live, Look for the story. It exists, it is extraordinary, and it is ancient. I believe that we are on the precipice of significant change in Victoria. But I have to say, First Peoples of Victoria do want to share this journey for making Victoria a better place, especially for our children, especially for the generations that come before and that they get the history, the true history of this place. Thank you very much. Tonight we've been privileged to have Professor Burke share with us her wisdom, thoughts, experience and insights about the importance that truth-telling and justice possesses, processes, hold for the Australian present and the Australian future. As Professor Burke has shared with us, truth-telling is a necessary first step towards the process of genuine and sincere 
treaty making, truth telling of the kind now taking place through Uruk provides the state of Victoria with an opportunity to draw a line in the sand. It is an opportunity for all Victorians to recognise and acknowledge the wrongs of the past and to resolve to right those wrongs by owning our past in ways that will help answer questions that concern what kind of society we wish to be in both the present and the future. Annie Eleanor, your words tonight are compelling because they draw on your personal experience as a person who grew up Aboriginal in Victoria. Although my Aboriginal identity links me to country in South Australia, the Northern Territory and Western Australia, many of the experiences that you describe in your oration tonight resonate with me as someone who also grew up proudly Aboriginal in regional Victoria. In responding to your oration, I want to speak specifically about the challenge that truth-telling poses to people of settler colonial origin in this state. Despite the very real risk of being re-traumatised by truth-telling processes like the Uruk Justice Commission, Indigenous peoples are willing to pay the price to gain settler recognition and acknowledgement of truth. But as you rightly ask in your oration, are settlers willing to pay a similar price for truth and for justice? Are we willing to become uncomfortable? I reflect on these questions by referencing some of the settler colonists in Victoria I have known best, my own family. As settler colonists, my family in Victoria have been the direct beneficiaries of the colonial and imperial systems first imported here in the 19th century. I am the descendant of people who came to the Victorian gold fields in the 1850s from England in search of a brighter social and economic future. They took up mining claims southwest of Ballarat at places they knew as Smysdale, Scarsdale, Browns and Newtown. They named the mining companies they formed with names like the New Victoria and the Jubilee. They achieved success they could never have dreamed of achieving in England. The gold they extracted from country made them rich and helped make the colony of Victoria so rich that for a time in the 1880s, it rivalled India as the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. After the gold rush came farming, and I spent much time as a child on the family farm at Newtown. The property was and continues to be named Primrose Hill. It was built on the site of the last family-owned mine. Life on the farm moved according to the customs and rituals that were imports from England. Strictly observed breaks for morning and afternoon tea. Hot roast beef served on Christmas Day, regardless of the outside temperature. <laughs> Fridays, fish and chips. When I became old enough to reflect on my interactions with my Aboriginal family in the Northern Territory and compare these interactions with those of my settler colonist family in Victoria, I started to ask my grandparents at Primrose Hill questions. I asked them who owned the farm before us, and I asked why there were no Aboriginal people in the towns and communities as I knew them. They told me that no one had owned the farm before our family and, the, and that the Aboriginal people, if there had been any in the district, had been killed and displaced by the squatocracy in a time before the gold rush. Our family were not implicated in frontier violence or the displacement of Aboriginal peoples from their country. These were answers that I never found convincing. 
The creek that cut through the farm was called Wody Yalloak. And I lived in a place called Windaree, a suburb of a town called Ballarat. Such place names evidence that this was Aboriginal land, but it remained hidden in plain sight to my settler colonial family. Primrose Hill was sold by my paternal grandfather in 1984. When he passed away in 1998, amongst his belongings was a large travel chest. It remained packed with clothing, blankets and tablecloths that had been brought out from England in the mid 19th century. The box and content suggested my settler family in Victoria remained in a permanent state of unease and unsettledness. Although the things about me that I speak of now are in the past, uh, and we might think they're irrelevant to the Victoria that we inhabit today, the fact is this past continues to weigh heavily on my experience of this place and this society. My settler colonist family continues to resist any discussion about Aboriginal Victoria. They are insular in their beliefs and exist trapped in a continue, continual state of denial about the role we played in the dispossession of the Wadarong people through the violation of their country. Except for a few notable exceptions, no one in my settler colonial family ever asked me about the work I do in academia. Issues that should be discussed at the dinner table continue to remain unspoken silences. Issues like voice and treaty and moving Australian society to a place of respect where Aboriginal schoolboys in Perth or in Melbourne can walk home safely, live long and productive lives and die old wise men are never spoken of. It remains too hard. My own family speak as if they do not know Aboriginal people. Despite all my frustration, disappointment and sometimes anger at their seeming inability to engage, these are not bad people. They are often generous and caring and seeking to be good members of the community. My childhood memories of grandparents at Primrose Hill are filled with feelings of love and appreciation. And yet these were people who lived out their lives blind to their geographic location in the world and un unable to engage with the realities of Australia that confronted them, whether past, present or future. When Professor Burke correctly emphasised that Aboriginal people alone cannot be responsible for the process of truth telling, and that, we, um, and that we have to go through this process together to come out the other side so we can build a shared foundation of truth and justice, I think of my own family and the challenges to engage people such as them in processes like Uruk in a way that is genuine, sincere and heartfelt. I also think of the role that institutions like this university can and should play in support of processes of truth-telling and justice. As a necessary first step, we should and we are recognising and acknowledging how the history of this institution is inseparable from the history of Australian settler colonialism and British imperialism and the impacts these had and continue to have on Aboriginal people in Victoria. But beyond a commitment to truth-telling and justice as a strategic commitment, is there more Melbourne and other Victoria-based universities could be doing to ensure the outcome of truth-telling that Professor Burke challenges us to achieve, a situation where all Victorians challenge their version of history in order to recognise, acknowledge and accept the truths that are held to be self-evident to Aboriginal peoples. As a university, we do need to engage 
more students with Indigenous studies and Indigenous knowledges. We also need to equip staff with appropriate training frameworks grounded in truth to encourage respect for Aboriginal people. And more than this, training that equips them to become effective allies in the support of Indigenous colleagues who desperately require effective allyship to carry forward our agenda of work. The words of wisdom shared with us tonight that set out both the urgent need for processes of truth-telling and the challenges of settler colonial engagement and support have not only prompted me to consider such challenges to truth by referencing my own family, but have also prompted me to think about the role the discipline of history as taught here and elsewhere in Australian systems of education has played and might continue to play in resisting truth-telling and justice. Moving the work of professional historians beyond the colonial archive to seek grounded engagements with Indigenous peoples and the knowledge traditions they use to remember times past will, I think, be of critical will be critical to telling the history of the Australian past that accepts the truths of Indigenous peoples. The NAM oration of 2022 is especially notable because it reminds us that the question, what is history, is central to our capability as a society to succeed in truth-telling endeavours like Uruk. We should never forget that as a modern academic discipline, history emerged as the handmaid of European nationalism. This close association to nationalism means that the discipline of history has stood behind the emergence of totalitarian states, fascist and socialist. The problem of history, as Benjamin pointed out, is that it makes sense of past times of humans according to the Hegelian doctrine that the end point of history is progress, justice, freedom and or equality, perhaps depending on which faculty uh, you work in. <laughs> Benjamin argued against the idea that progress was inevitable and warned us against a blind faith in the victor's version of the past. As he put it, instead of being inevitab inevitable, progress in human history exists only as a narrow go gate through which the Messiah might enter. Moments of historical revolution are always waiting somewhere in the shadows on the margin. They happen when messianic time is able to rupture the orthodoxy of historical truths. Our collective participation in truth-telling provides one such revolutionary moment where progress in human history can be delivered. We must do, do so to save our ancestors, whether Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, from what Benjamin calls the victor's truth. In his most famous quote, he said, even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. In her oration, oration this evening, Professor Burke has called upon each of us to do our bit to help in her great task of truth-telling. And I hope this call to action is embraced and acted upon, for our ancestors will only be safe if we never give up in the fight and defence of a more truthful and just society. The dividend to be paid for the price of truth-telling for Aboriginal peoples is well understood as recognition and acknowledgement. For settler colonists, that dividend perhaps rests in true relocation, psychological as well as physical, to Australia as a necessary and long overdue precursor to finding respectful relationship with country. 
We all need to find peace and belonging and the important work being undertaken by Professor Burke and her colleagues offers us a pathway to their achievement. I hope we are now mature enough as a society to accept such necessary gifts. I wish to end my response with sincere and grateful thanks to Professor Burke. On behalf of all of you who came up your time this evening to attend this, the NAM oration of 2022, thank you and good evening. Bugger